to avoid getting screwed by your contractor. This is Matthew Struck with Treadstone Risk Management. This is day 12 of our 30 days of insurance and risk management vlog. Um, we're going to be covering today something that plagues a lot of or, or is a thorn in the side of a lot of businesses and homeowners for that matter. Um, you have work that needs to be done. You can't do it yourself or do it internally within your organization. You need to bring in a contractor or professional from the outside in order to do that work. So the question is, how do you hire them responsibly and make sure that you're protecting yourself to the maximum? All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is include your, inter your attorney in the contract and the bid construction. Okay? And the second thing I'm going to tell you is include your insurance and risk management professional in the contract and the bid construction. And there's uh, very important reasons on either side of that. The attorney is going to include and, and you know always include them because if you use just a boilerplate, there might be some very specific circumstances that both of those professionals are going to be able to pick up on that require some added uh, sections or some different language within the documentation. And furthermore, you need to include those professionals because those very specific situations in the insurance front specifically, um, you know, they're going to require different types of insurance. They're going to require different types of wording that the contractor is going to have to comply with. All right. I'm going to offer you a word of caution. Don't take an attorney's insurance uh, recommendations as gospel. Okay. Attorneys are very smart people. They go to school for a long time. They understand the law typically extremely well, okay? They are not insurance professionals. And so a lot of times the insurance knowledge they have is uh, a good baseline, but it's not nowhere near someone who kind of eats, sleeps, and breathes insurance and risk management on a day-to-day -day basis, all right? Um, the next thing I'm going to tell you is that uh, you should always in include the insurance requirements within the bid and within the contract. <clears throat> if you don't, you run the risk of some, some bigger issues down the line, which we'll cover. And then when available, you can use standard insurance requirements to build your insurance requirements off of. But again, always include your insurance and risk management professional because they're going to know those kind of little uh, nuanced or, or specific or specialized coverages that the contractor should include within their coverages. All right, so why can't you include the insurance coverages after the fact? Meaning, why can't I just hire the contractor because I, you know, vet them, they do good work, and, you know, I see what they've done in the past, or, you know, I know the guy, um, and then just give them the insurance requirements after the fact. Well, first of all, insurance requirements, uh, to comply with them, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into that. Each contractor is going to have a specific kind of profile when it comes to getting insurance, the same as any other business or organization. They have, uh, you know, depending on the type of insurance, the limits of the insurance, and the background and the history of the contractor, specifically the claims history, in a lot of cases, the contractor might not be able to comply with the insurance requirements that you really need in order to protect yourself or your organization. And as a result of that, you might end up awarding a contract to a contractor and then having to claw it back. Or the contractor is going to come back to you and say, look, I didn't include the pricing for this special type of insurance in, in my bid. I can't stick to the price that I quoted you. I have to jack it up a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of money, um, and all of those are headaches that you don't want to deal with. It's always easy enough just to clear the air right from the beginning. The second reason why you want to include the insurance requirements right from the get is because a lot of insurance policies that the contractor might carry require that the insurance requirements be actually in the contract and in the bid docs. And uh, it's because they want that actually signed off on by the contractor and by who's hiring them that that's actually what they're agree agreeing to provide, uh, especially if they're going to be extending that coverage to cover you in the event of a claim. All right. So uh, the next question or the next topic that we're going to cover are uh, is hold harmless and indemnification agreements. Um, what are they? Well, they're essentially two sections. They're typically two separate paragraphs, but they're usually right next to each other within a contract that your attorney is going to include. And they're the first step in good risk transfer. 
when I say risk transfer, risk transfer is essentially the process of uh, transferring the risk of paying for claims and losses and damages to another party. In this case, you're transferring that risk to the contractor, and there's good reason. The contractor is getting paid to do a job, and if their uh, execution of performing that job or those job duties results in damages or a, a lawsuit or something like that, they should be the ones to have to pay for it, not you. But you have to transfer that risk properly, otherwise you could get stuck with the bill. So the hold harmless indemnification sections essentially are the promise, they're the first prong. The second prong is the insurance, which is after we make the promise, the insurance is how we're going to pay to, to backstop the promise. The uh, hold harmless indemnification agreements will uh, include language that essentially says, we're going to make sure that uh, we're not going to hold you responsible for anything that happens as a result of our actions or operations. And if there is a loss, if there is some kind of damage or some damages paid out or money's lost, we're going to make you whole. We're going to, we're going to compensate you for it. All right, what insurance requirements should I include in the contract each time? Well, I'm actually going to punt on this one. Uh, the next module within our 30-day series, day 13, is going to be a uh, overview of the standard insurance requirements that you should require that a contractor have when they come on your site or they do work for you. So definitely check that out. Check the full text-based article on treadstonerisk.com. Go to the news section, uh, and then there's a little drop-down, and it says, you know, go to the blog or go to TRM Risk Advisor, and you can find that, that module in there, or you could also find the video on YouTube. All right, so the last section I'm going to talk about on this topic is just our kind of additional notes section. Uh, I'm going to be reading off my cheat sheet here, so I apologize, but uh, there's a handful of them here. Um, Always include uh, job safety requirements within the contract. <clears throat> so uh, basic job safety requirements would be, thing, be things like protective fencing around the job site, uh, compliance scaffolding, uh, you know, other types of requirements that might be associated with the, um, you know, protecting pollution conditions from originating. Uh, pollution conditions is actually one of the big overlooked insurance requirements that a lot of uh, insureds or a lot of project uh, owners might overlook that an insurance and risk management professional will build in. You can require that the contractor comply with, you know, certain types of regulations or certain types of safety protocols to make sure that they don't end up having a pollution condition originate from them working on your location. Uh, also, always include a daily and final cleanup requirement within the contract. The last thing you want is a contractor completing their work for the day, but leaving materials or leaving an unsafe or a hazardous condition on the job site that results in a claim after the fact. Always request a copy of the additional insured endorsement, okay? So within your insurance requirements, you're going to require that your entity gets named as an additional insured, meaning the contractor is going to extend their coverage to you as if you were an insured under their policy, okay? But what you also want to require is that they give you the actual endorsement that extends that coverage. And there's a reason for it. It's because not all additional insured endorsements are the same. Some of them have really wacky conditions or requirements to actually extend that coverage. The two big uh, groups or, or kinds of additional insured endorsements that are out there are one is scheduled, meaning that your entity or entities actually have to be named in the policy. And so that's why you want a copy is to see that all of the names are included in the policy. And then the uh, second type is what's called blanket, blanket additional insured status. And the, the major requirement on that one is that there is a signed contract that requires that additional insured status be extended to the various entities that uh, you're requiring that they extend it to. And so going back to the beginning, that's what I was talking about in terms of getting those insurance requirements included in the bid and included in the contract is because if they're not, a lot of times that can invalidate the additional insured coverage that would come from the contractor if they're not in that signed contract or in the bid. All right, uh, maintain work orders and purchase orders uh, and you know daily work uh, schedules on the site. 
And this is just because if you have a site where you have a lot of professionals, a lot of trades or skills, you know, skills, uh, trade skills workers on the location at any given time, sometimes a, a claim can happen and you don't necessarily know who was responsible or you don't necessarily know who was on location that day or at that time. The next one is keep documentation, and I put for 10 years. I always gonna, I'm always going to tell you <clears throat> I'm located out of New Jersey, so typically the requirements you know, uh, and, and the statutes and the regulations that I'm citing uh, a lot of times will be New Jersey specific. But uh, 10 years is a nice round number. So if your state has less stringent, you might want to keep it for keep the documentation for a little bit longer. Uh, if it has more stringent, ob obviously comply with those requirements. But the reason why you want to keep the documentation for 10 years is because a lot of times a claim doesn't necessarily happen during the construction or immediately after the building is occupied or completed or put into operation. It can happen two, three, five years down the line. Um, there are countless numbers of examples of architects that made an error, a uh, structural error in their design. And when the building was completed, no one knew the problem existed until the building collapsed three or five years after the project. Uh, and in that case, you're going to need that documentation to help build your case and make sure that that architect is going to make good on their uh, their requirement to hold you harmless and cover you for that loss. All right, and the last thing I'm going to say is uh, more so in terms of your uh, collaboration with your attorney, pay attention to the types of indemnification agreements and clauses that you include in your contract. Um, in some states, uh, they require that you have certain types of clauses, and in other states, they give you some options. Okay, they range from broad um, to intermediate to limited, okay? And as you could imagine, based off of those names, the, uh, the indemnification clause can uh, vary in terms of what kind of protection it provides you, all right? So uh, thank you. Uh, that was day 12, uh, talking about how to not get screwed by your contractor. Uh, please subscribe, uh, hit like, share it, uh, send us your comments or comment down below or ask us questions. We're looking to get back to you and have a narrative with you. And uh, we'll see you on day 13.